This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 291 of the program. Today is Friday, May 21st, and I am officially fully vaccinated as of today. It's been two weeks since my second dose of the Moderna shot, and it feels really good. So I just had to point that out because I think that that's worth celebrating. Uh, So we've got some stories to talk about, but of course, we're not going to talk about anything until we thank the folks who make this show possible. All of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increase the monthly pledge that they were already giving us. And that includes Blah Blah, Eve, Jerk, and Sekmara. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com forward slash humanist report, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week, we've got quite a bit of topics to talk about, but of course, we will continue our coverage of Israel's massacre in Gaza. And specifically, we'll talk about how the Biden administration is continuing to enable Netanyahu's war crimes. And we'll also talk about Rashida Tlaib's confrontation with Biden about his ongoing support for Israel. And staying on the subject, we'll also talk about how the tide is finally starting to turn in the United States on this issue. Alan Dershowitz attacks Bernie Sanders for condemning Israel. The country's largest nurses union condemns the CDC's new mask guidelines. The Supreme Court will, in fact, take up a direct challenge to Roe v. Wade. Joe Rogan parrots old right-wing talking points. Katie Porter exposes a pharmaceutical CEO's greed. Chile is on the cusp of undoing decades of neoliberalism with a new constitution. And we'll talk about a hospital that's choosing to sue thousands of patients during a pandemic, even after they saw their revenue rise last year. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. Hopefully you enjoy what I have in store for you. Let's get right to it. In case you took a break from the news cycle over the weekend, let me get you up to speed on what took place, specifically all of the war crimes that Israel did over just the last couple of days. First of all, they killed nearly 60 Palestinian children, a number that is likely to rise by the time you see this video. On top of that, they destroyed the road leading to Gaza's main hospital. And additionally, they intentionally destroyed a building housing press offices, including the Associated Press, which for those of you who don't know, this is a war crime. Now, the Associated Press reports that it had no indication that Hamas was in the building. And of course, they'd want to verify this, knowing that if Hamas was in the building that their journalists were in, that would make them a target of the Israeli military. So they had no incentive to lie here, and they claimed that they verified. But Israel, they have every incentive to lie here. However, you know, They don't really care what the AP says because they claim that they have irrefutable proof that Hamas was, in fact, in that building and they supplied the United States government with that proof. Although, for whatever reason, the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, says he has not seen the evidence yet and he's kind of an important person who they'd want to get this information to immediately. You know, it's almost as if the Israeli government knew what they were doing. They lied to justify their war crime, and they didn't like that news outlets like the Associated Press were reporting on their war crimes. So they bombed them to blatantly silence the media. I mean, they are as brazen as you can possibly be. Now, if you're wondering why the Israeli government is so brazen, well, I'll get to that. I'll tell you why. Spoiler alert, it's because of the United States government, but to top off their weekend of terror attacks against the Palestinian people, they took to Twitter to post rocket emojis. Lots and lots of rocket emojis. Now, they claim that each rocket emoji signifies a rocket fired at the Israeli people by Hamas. However, I wonder how long that thread would be if they had a rocket emoji for all of the airstrikes they dropped on the heads of Palestinian women and children. How long would that thread be if they actually listed all of these civilian casualties and represented said civilian casualties with emojis? Now, here's the thing about uh, what's going on in Gaza and Palestine. We're complicit. Our government supplied Israel with the bombs that they are using on children. And the Biden administration can effectively end all of this almost immediately 
with a simple phone call. So what is he doing? Well, here's what he's doing instead. As Ellen Mitchell of The Hill reports, the Biden administration has approved $735 million worth of precision guided weapons to be sold to Israel, a congressional aide confirmed to The Hill on Monday. The sale, which Congress was officially notified of on May 5th, has concerned some House Democrats who have pressed the administration to limit military support for the Israeli government in the face of its growing assault on Gaza. A majority of the possible sale is of Boeing-made joint direct attack munitions, equipment that can and make unguided bombs dropped from aircraft into guided missiles, the aide confirmed. Okay, so let me get this straight. In response to us giving Israel the weapons that they are now using to massacre civilians in Gaza, what does the Biden administration do? They offer them more weapons. Okay, maybe we're being a little bit too uncharitable here. Maybe it's not as bad as it sounds. Maybe this is some twisted attempt at soft diplomacy and Biden is maybe trying to send a message. Hey, if you want more bombs, stop dropping the last bombs that we gave you. I mean, maybe that's the case. Although, believe it or not, that probably isn't the case because the Biden administration isn't attaching any stipulations to the weapons. He basically knows what these weapons will be used for. AP reports the White House says President Joe Biden expressed, quote, support for a ceasefire in a call to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu Monday, the eighth day of Israeli-Palestinian fighting. The Biden administration distanced itself Monday from growing calls by Democrats and others for an immediate ceasefire between Israel and Gaza's Hamas rulers as fighting entered a second week with more than 200 people dead, most of them Palestinians in Gaza. The United States, Israel's top ally, also blocked for the third time what would have been a unanimous statement by the 15-nation UN Security Council expressing grave concern over the intensifying Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the loss of civilian lives. The final U.S. rejection Monday killed the Security Council statement, at least for now. Okay, well, never mind. It literally is as bad as it sounds. Biden is expressing support for a ceasefire. And of course, he was very, very clear in that call. I'm sure that both sides are equally culpable here. But, um... <laughs> If you thought that that was bad, it's actually an improvement from a worse statement that the White House put out via Twitter over the weekend, which reads, Today, the president spoke with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, reaffirmed his strong support for Israel's right to defend itself against rocket attacks from Hamas and other terrorist groups in Gaza, and condemned these indiscriminate attacks against Israel. So once again, he's echoing the same sentiment he expressed before. Israel has the right to defend itself. They have the right to indiscriminately drop bombs on Gaza, one of the most densely populated areas in the world with 50% children. And uh, it's perfectly fine. It's not a war crime. You know, they can literally bomb buildings, housing journalists, and that's fine. We'll still give them millions of dollars worth of bombs that we know they'll use for war crimes. I mean, imagine if your friend was going to commit an act of murder and you know that this is what he wanted to do and he asked you for a knife and you gave him the knife and then he went and committed the act of murder. Well, you just supplied that murderer with the murder weapon. Therefore, you're partially culpable. You're a co-conspirator. You helped this individual carry out a murder. You aided and abetted this individual. You knew this individual was going to commit an act of murder and you gave him the weapon knowing his intent. That's what's happening here with Joe Biden. So this isn't just a defense of Israel. This isn't just him greenlighting the war crimes that Israel is carrying out in Gaza. This is Joe Biden being culpable, being a co-conspirator here. So Benjamin Netanyahu is a war criminal, and he should be in prison for the rest of his life for the crimes against humanity that he's carrying out right now. And guess what? Joe Biden should join him because what he's doing is he's giving Benjamin Netanyahu, a psychopath, the weapons that he's using to slaughter innocent civilians. And that can't stand for a president who ran on decency and restoring the soul of America. He's proving that America never had a soul if we enable atrocities like this and we won't even allow the UN Security Council to express concern about Israel's war crimes. I mean, 
It's, it's stunningly disgusting, but this is the status quo that Joe Biden is continuing to carry out. But unfortunately for these war criminals, the tide is beginning to turn and more and more people, including American news agencies, are waking up to the reality of the situation, that Israel is the occupier and the aggressor, and there's no both sides to this. I mean, we saw how AP in that article was still both sides in this. They say Israel-Palestinian fighting after Israel literally bombed their news outlet. But the tide slowly but surely is turning. Things are changing. And those individuals who are defending Israel's war crimes very quickly will find themselves on the wrong side of history. As the people who defended South African apartheid are now finding themselves on the wrong side of history. I'm always sick. I'm always, I don't know. I can't do anything. See, all of this. What, what do you expect me to do? Fix it? I'm only 10. I can't even do anything in this war. I just want to be a doctor or anything to help my people, my cat. I'm just a kid. I don't even know what to do. I get scared, but not really that much. I get, I do anything for my people, but I don't know what to do. I'm just 10. I'm just 10. All of this, when I see it, I literally cry every day saying to myself, why do we deserve this? Why, what did we do to this? Videos like that, especially when they go viral on social media, is part of the reason why I think slowly but surely the tide is beginning to turn when it comes to Israeli apartheid, because we're no longer just being presented with one side of the story. Now, Palestinians can take to social media and actually share their experiences, remind people that they are capable of feeling pain and suffering as well. And it's a lot more difficult to deny the humanity of an entire group of people when it's right up in your face. And so the tide isn't just changing with regard to the sentiment towards the apartheid state of Israel, but we're even beginning to start to see a shift in U.S. media. And we'll talk about the John Oliver segment, which I never would have thought would happen in a million years. But more significant, perhaps, is the response from Democratic Party politicians who aren't mincing words. They're very clear in their unequivocal condemnations of Israel. And I talked about this over the weekend uh, in the Twitch clip that I posted where we talked about this on Thursday. But I want to share a clip from uh, my appearance on TYT where I explain why this is so significant. Look, if you called Israel an apartheid state on air on cable news just a couple of years ago, yeah. you would have been taken off the air for sure. That's, and anybody can that denies it is totally and not living in reality. You couldn't even say occupation on air without issuing some sort of a correction. That was taboo as well. And the beauty of their speeches is that everything that they're saying, like they're not mincing words. They're unequivocally condemning Israel. And that matters. You know, even the folks who disagree with what's happening and aren't peddling the whole, oh, well, Israel has the right to defend itself line. You know, they may not necessarily want to speak up because they know that the Israel lobby is going to bankroll their opponent's campaign come election time. But that's already happening to Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar. So they have nothing to lose at this point. And that's why they're speaking with so much clarity. Uh, yeah. they, don't, they don't care because everything that could have been done against them has already been done. So now you know the, the, the shackles have, have been released and they're just speaking on this issue as it is. And what is happening is apartheid. And to have any member of Congress say the words apartheid truly is a game changer. 100%. Exactly. And to give you some additional context, the best that we got in 2014 during Israel's massacre of Gaza then from a Democratic Party politician was from Jessica Ramos. I don't even think she was actually an elected lawmaker. I think she was just like the chair of the New York City Democrats. But either way, all she posted was a tweet that said Palestine with the heart emoji. And for that, people were calling for her head. That was contentious. Palestine heart emoji was extremely controversial in 2014. But now, lawmakers in the Democratic Party are calling it exactly as it is. They're saying, this is an apartheid regime. And AOC just tweeted out, apartheid states aren't democracies. So they're not just describing the situation accurately. On top of that, they're also holding their peers accountable. So I also talked about how Mark Pocan, on the House floor, 
He read a quote where he basically states, if you are silent in the face of oppression, then you side with the oppressors. And I've got to say, the silence of many Democratic Party politicians is deafening. But what's nice to see for the first time ever are their colleagues, members of the squad, progressive Democrats, actually calling them out. So, for example, right-wing Democrat Richie Torres, he took to the New York Post to write an op-ed where he basically pretends to be courageous by going against the Twitter mob and defending Israeli apartheid. But he's not doing this on Twitter, so he's doing this on a platform where he is protected from the quote-unquote Twitter mob. But his colleague Jamal Bowman called him out for this, saying, my brother Richie, this is not about a Twitter mob. This is about justice, humanity, and equality. This is about Palestinians deserving peace, land, and self-determination like everyone else. This is about Palestinians having their land and homes taken from them and our ignorance of Palestinian pain. That is the truth, my brother. So to actually see members of Congress call out the apartheid regime, support BDS explicitly, and on top of that, hold their colleagues accountable and call out their lies about the situation, this is a paradigm shift. This is incredibly new. And what really makes it seem like things are different is to see segments like this on major television networks in the United States. Lots is complicated here, but some things are pretty simple. One side is suffering much more. And if America really wants to help, it might want to seriously consider changing its long-held position here. Because for decades, the backbone of America's policy in the Middle East has been that America is an unwavering friend to Israel, which is a great thing to try and be. But at the end of the day, I would hope that a real friend would tell me when I'm being an asshole, and definitely when I'm committing a fucking war crime. Let me just say that if you followed politics back in 2014 and you followed Israel's massacre of Gaza back then, to see a segment like this on television, it would have broke the internet. But now this is becoming more and more common. And Ali Belchi of MSNBC, a network that is usually biased and just toes the line of the Democratic Party establishment, he came out and said what I didn't think I'd ever hear a pundit on mainstream media say. Palestinians are, at best, third-class citizens in the nation of their birth. The idea that it's even remotely controversial to call what Israel has imposed on Palestinians a form of apartheid is laughable. One look at a current map of Israel, Gaza, and the occupied territories conjures up only one other example, apartheid-era South Africa. The Israeli government, on an ongoing basis, declares parcels of land on which Palestinians live to be either of military or archaeological importance, causing residents to be evicted. Sometimes there's a court case, and almost always the Palestinians lose. Yet months or weeks later, that same important land suddenly becomes home to a brand new Israeli settlement. As more and more Jewish settlers take over land on which Arabs live, the occupied West Bank becomes de facto more Israeli and in the explicit hopes of the Israeli government, more Jewish. This is a long-standing attempt and a deliberate attempt to force Arabs who have lived in that land sometimes for hundreds of years out. It's an attempt to dilute their presence because to have Arabs as full participants is in the opinion of the Israeli government and their courts diluting Israel. Just prior to the pandemic, I toured many of the contested areas and homes from which Arabs are being pushed out, both in Israel proper and in the occupied territories. Palestinians don't control the important parts of their lives. Palestinian families are refused permits to build or renovate their homes. When they connect their homes to the municipal water supply, Israeli soldiers sometimes cut the pipes. When they attempt to harness solar energy because their homes are not on the grid, Israeli soldiers literally come and remove solar panels from their homes. I spent an hour and a half traveling alongside an elderly Palestinian woman who was being transferred between three ambulances from Gaza to the no man's land in between and then into Israel to get cancer treatment. Three ambulances over the course of one mile, more than an hour to cross the border. That's how Gazans live, without medical treatment because Israel prevents it, without electricity much of the time because Israel prevents it, without the ability to fish in the Mediterranean Ocean because Israel prevents it, without an airport or a seaport because Israel prevents it. Like Israelis, Palestinians also have a right to exist and to defend themselves, but there is no one willing to help them do that, not the Israeli courts, and not the U.S. government. What the U.S. also shares with Israel is the belief that Hamas, the political party that governs Gaza, is a terrorist organization that calls for the destruction of Israel. 
Hamas is supported by the majority of Palestinians in Gaza. Hamas may not be in the best long-term interests of the Gazans, but peace hasn't really worked out for them. Faced with an Israeli government which pens them into what has been called the world's largest open-air prison, they have chosen a government that most of us wouldn't prefer, one that is not given to negotiation and moderation and respect for its neighbor. Israel needs a new approach to the Palestinians, and America needs a new approach to Israel. After more than seven decades of not just being deprived of land from which they were evicted, Palestinian frustration runs deep. It may be worth going deeper than what you may hear inside your bubble and understanding the depth to which the Palestinian people are subject to apartheid in their own land, deprived of basic necessities and subject to relentless civil rights violations. This is not a secret. It's out there for you to see. You just have to look for it. By now, I'm sure that you've seen this segment, but I've got to say I had to share it at length because... This is truly remarkable. And I am usually one to argue that words don't really amount to much. But when it comes to this issue, we have had so little progress that to see such a gigantic shift in rhetoric and tone is truly a game changer. It's really incredibly important. So I don't know what it is. Again, perhaps it's videos from social media of Palestinians like the one that we saw of that 10-year-old Palestinian girl. Perhaps Israel has gone just a little bit too brazen with the war crimes, bombing buildings that house Associated Press journalists. I don't necessarily know, but I will tell you this. Something feels different, and we're finally beginning to wake up when it comes to this issue collectively as a country, I think. It's the beginning, but it's a really important start. And what I would recommend to everyone who's watching this, who's still trying to both sides it or sides with Israel as they literally carry out an ethnic cleansing, it is not too late to get on the right side of history. The tide is turning and history is seeing this as it really is. So it's not too late for you. You can get on the right side of history and you can actually open your heart and understand what's happening to the Palestinian people and you could stand in solidarity with human beings who just want to live on their land, who want to stop being evicted from their homes, who have a right to not be slaughtered by a far-right extremist government that wants an ethnostate. And I'll leave that there. It's not too late for you. Get on the right side of history while you still can. Because I can guarantee you that the folks who are on the wrong side of history when it comes to South African apartheid, now they probably feel very embarrassed about their decision to support that atrocity. Individuals who were against gay marriage and gay rights in the 80s and 90s are now very embarrassed, I'd imagine, about their position. And we know exactly where this issue is headed as well. So it's not too late. Actually open your heart and more importantly, educate yourself and support the Palestinian people in their struggle for self-determination and to exist. Thankfully, Bernie Sanders is one of the better United States senators on the issue of Israel-Palestine. But let me tell you, he's still not perfect, and he has come a long way since 2014. So let me just remind you the way that Bernie Sanders spoke about this issue during a town hall in 2014. He got lots of pushback because of this. Take a look. Hamas has used money that came into Gaza for construction purposes, and God knows they need roads and all the things that they need, and use some of that money to build these very sophisticated tunnels into Israel for military purposes. For survival purposes. Okay, one, one second. Yes, now, I don't want to be interrupted. The question was asked. It's a fair question. And the I'm trying to... The war, okay, so Israel has the right to look, resist. If you don't... Yes, they did. You know, is I, excuse me. Again. Shut up. What you do don't you? have the microphone. Do you You've you asked... You know, I don't want police officers here. You're going to arrest people? No, I'm not going to arrest people. But are you going to allow us? Are you going to allow us to have a discussion? What do you think? You come down here. You're up there. Come down to be Democrat. So have a discussion with people. Are you asking for the point? Occupy Palestine. Are you asking for the point? 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 Are you Okay. 
you can't come to a meeting and ask the question, then please, don't come to me. To say that Bernie Sanders has improved on this issue would be an understatement. You can argue that he's done a complete 180 on this issue. And uh, people during the town hall were outraged because they asked Bernie Sanders about the war crimes being carried out by the Israeli government. And he acknowledged that their response was disproportionate, right? And they were overreacting. The issue was that he still kept focusing on Hamas. But what about Hamas this and Hamas that? And Israel has the right to defend itself. And they were trying to educate him on this issue. And after years, Bernie Sanders finally is changing his mind on this. And that's really important. So I'm not showing you that video to attack Bernie Sanders and smear him and make it seem as if he's less progressive as he should be. I'm sharing that video with you because I want you to know that there's hope. We can change hearts and minds. Not everyone is as principled and objective as Bernie Sanders, but it is possible to actually change people's minds on this issue. And maybe you're not convinced yet that Palestinians have the right to exist, but there's still a chance for you to change your mind. So Bernie Sanders has made a tremendous amount of progress on this issue. And in an op-ed for the New York Times, he wrote, the U.S. must stop being an apologist for the Netanyahu government. And in this op-ed, he says, let's be clear. No one is arguing that Israel or any government does not have the right to self-defense or to protect its people. So why are these words repeated year after year, war after war? And why is the question almost never asked, what are the rights of the Palestinian people? In this moment of crisis, the United States should be urging an immediate ceasefire. We should also understand that while Hamas firing rockets into Israeli communities is absolutely unacceptable, today's conflict did not begin with those rockets. Over more than a decade of his right-wing rule in Israel, Mr. Netanyahu has cultivated an increasingly intolerant and authoritarian type of racist nationalism. In his frantic effort to stay in power and avoid prosecution for corruption, Mr. Netanyahu has legitimized these forces, including Itamar Ben-Gir, an extremist Jewish power party, by bringing them into government. It is shocking and sad that racist mobs that attack Palestinians on the streets of Jerusalem now have representation in its Knesset. Now he goes on to call for an immediate ceasefire and he calls on Joe Biden to actually condition the aid that we're sending to Israel. Now it's not perfect, right? He doesn't mention apartheid in that article and to my knowledge, he still doesn't support BDS. He's against the crackdown in the U.S. against BDS, but he doesn't necessarily see BDS as a solution himself. But when you compare what Bernie is saying now to what he said back in 2014, it is, it's a huge difference. It's like night and day, and it's really important. Now, part of the reason why a lot of lawmakers don't want to speak out in defense of the Palestinian people is because any and all condemnation of the Israeli government's actions is usually conflated with anti-Semitism. What? You're condemning this far-right extremist Benjamin Netanyahu? It must be because you're an anti-Semite. So the question is, when somebody who's a Jewish American like Bernie Sanders condemns the far-right extremist government of Israel, what's the response? Well, it's the same response. They tweak it a little bit. Rather than saying that he's anti-Semitic, they just say he's a self-hating Jew. And if you read the op-ed that Bernie Sanders wrote, there is zero indication that he is a self-hating Jew. But that didn't stop Alan Dershowitz from going on the far-right Newsmax TV and calling Bernie Sanders just that, and ironically condemning Palestine for war crimes. You get, inadvertently, you get the social media supporting Hamas, the New York Times supporting Hamas, and it sends a very powerful message. Do it again. Kill children you know, kill civilians, attack, 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 commit war crimes, you'll prevail on this because of the anti-Semitism that stimulates so much of this. And you can be a Jew and an anti-Semite. Uh, you know, Bert Biden uh, has made some strong statements uh, positively, and I commend him for that. But Bernie Sanders, who's Jewish, is a self-hating Jew, a self-hating Jew who is willing to see Israel be defeated militarily by a terrorist group because he's on the hard left and he has to follow the hard left. And that's what he has been doing. Think of how preposterous and idiotic this argument is from Alan Dershowitz. He's calling Bernie Sanders a self-hating Jew because Bernie Sanders condemned ethnic cleansing and genocide from a far-right government that wants an ethno state, quite literally. That makes him a self-hating Jew. That's moronic. And this isn't necessarily an argument that only Alan Dershowitz is peddling. Lots of people who are staunchly pro-Israel, uh, Israel, usually funded by the Israeli lobby, by the way, 
they are saying the same exact thing. So in an interview with Ali Velshi on MSNBC, who's been great on this issue, by the way, uh, Bernie Sanders responded to this, responded to claims that criticisms of the Israeli government is anti-Semitic. And Bernie Sanders, um, he had a great take. Senator, um, you, you published an op-ed. I, I uh, delivered a commentary yesterday on the fact that we, we do need to start taking the rights of uh, the human rights of Palestinians into account. Senator Ted Cruz, not talking about you, but talking about the squad's uh, opposition to, um, to things. He, he, he said this on Thursday. It's disgraceful that you have members of the United States Congress that basically operate as shills for terrorists and undermine Israel. And they undermine Israel so often that after a while you start to say, okay, we get it. You don't like the Jews. Folks have said that about you too. Um, how do we how do we understand the ability to criticize the policies of the Israeli government as being entirely separate from and counter to anti-Semitism? Well, oh, that's exactly right. The Israeli government has evolved over the years into a pretty strong right-wing government. And their coalition now includes people who are overt racists. And when you have the United States of America, Ali, putting almost $4 billion a year into Israel, we have the right to demand that they respect the human rights of all people, including the Palestinians. What we need now is an even-handed policy which protects the security of Israel. They have a light right to live in peace and security without terrorist attacks, but the people in the Palestinian territories also have a right to live in peace and dignity. And anyone who takes a look at what's going on in Gaza right now, where youth unemployment is 70%, and I'm talking about before this current war and the terrible things that have happened in the war, where youth unemployment is sky high, where people can't get electricity and clean water on a regular basis, this is a territory controlled by Israel. So we got to deal with the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. We got to deal with that. But we have also got to create a situation where the people in the Palestinian territories are respected as well. Yeah. So what he's basically saying is what's wrong is wrong. It doesn't matter who you are and where you come from. Genocide is genocide. Ethnic cleansing is ethnic cleansing. My words, not his, of course, but the sentiment remains don't let these bloodthirsty fools intimidate you into thinking that it's anti-semitic to condemn the right-wing government of israel that wants an ethno state they're the ones who are actually racist they're the ones who are prejudiced who hate another group of people because of their identity it is not anti-semitic to condemn the right-wing government of israel to not condemn the right-wing government of israel means you actually don't care about people who are suffering. So don't let them try to weaponize their identities to shut down criticism. This is just a diversion tactic pushed by the Israeli lobby to get people to turn a blind eye to the war crimes being committed by Israel. But no, silence is unacceptable. And for those like Andrew Yang and Richie Torres who go out of their way to defend the ethnic cleansing that Israel is doing currently against the Palestinian people, they're the ones who will be viewed as the intolerant bigots who support something so egregious that I don't think it's that long until all of history sees what's happening. In fact, I can't even say that. The rest of the world already sees what's happening. It's just the United States who brainwashes its citizens. But again, even that's starting to change as some U.S. media outlets are calling it what it is, an apartheid. They're calling Israel an apartheid state. They're calling Benjamin Netanyahu a war criminal because he is. And the United States is the sole vote that blocks condemnation of this on the UN Security Council. So honestly, we stand alone in the world in allowing this to take place. So understand that in the broader context of world history and the fight for justice, we know who's on the right side of history. I think that's very obvious. It's not folks like Alan Dershowitz. It's folks who stand up for the Palestinian people. And that should be obvious. It shouldn't be this controversial. People shouldn't be this afraid to speak up because they're afraid that condemning a psychopath like Netanyahu means that they're anti-Semitic. That's preposterous. And we have to absolutely vociferously push back against this moronic narrative. We have to. 
The CDC shocked a lot of people when they announced a new guideline for COVID-19 masking, saying people vaccinated against COVID-19 can go without masks indoors and outdoors. Now, this is great news. They base this off of new studies that conclude that not only are you very, very well protected against the virus if you've been fully vaccinated, but on top of that, you're less likely to to spread the virus to other individuals, because if you've been vaccinated, then you're less likely to have a larger viral load, which infects other people. So it's really good news to get this information and these studies. The issue is, without the enforcement of some sort of system or vaccine passports, how exactly is this enforceable? How exactly are businesses supposed to determine who is and isn't vaccinated? Well, um, according to Dr. Anthony Fauci, they're just going to use the honor system. So more than 40% of adults, we should note, still are not fully vaccinated. Some are partially, but not fully. There's no real way right now to track who's vaccinated, who isn't vaccinated. There's a lot of resistance to any sort of vaccine passport, but how are restaurants, airlines, others supposed to know if the people coming to their establishments or their vehicles without masks really have the right to not, not well, we all have a right to do whatever we want, but really have the CDC guidance supporting uh, they're not wearing masks? Well, Jake, they will not be able to know. I mean, you're going to be depending on people being honest enough to say whether they were vaccinated or not and responsible enough to be wearing a vaccine, excuse me, a, a mask, not only for their own protection, but also for the protection of others. So in other words, we'll be trusting people like this. What could go wrong? Now, listen, I feel frustrated with this, right? Because on one hand, the vaccines work. That's what the CDC is communicating here. And that's really important. And it could be used by the CDC to encourage people to vaccinate. Look, if you uh, don't want to wear a mask anymore, get vaccinated and you no longer have to. The issue is that this comes at a time when not everyone is fully vaccinated. In fact, we're about 50% of the population having received at least one shot. But there's still a lot of people not fully vaccinated, myself included. I mean, I had my second shot, but it's not until the two-week point after your second dose where you're considered fully vaccinated. And furthermore, people who are eligible for the vaccine who are 18 as of April 19th, they're still not fully vaccinated. And children aren't able to get vaccinated yet. So this raises a lot of questions and this guideline is pretty vague and it's led to organizations like the National Nurses United Union to condemn the CDC here. As Julia Conley of Common Dreams reports, the largest nurses union in the United States is calling on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to revoke the guidance on mask wearing and social distancing that the agency released last week, calling the significantly scaled back guidelines dangerous as the U.S. and other countries continue to face the coronavirus pandemic and new variants of COVID-19. National Nurses United circulated a petition over the weekend gathering signatures of Americans who were confused and alarmed by the CDC's new guidance. Soon after, the the union released a statement condemning public health authorities for recommending that fully vaccinated people stop wearing masks and social distancing in most situations. Quote, this newest CDC guidance is not based on science, does not protect public health, and threatens the lives of patients, nurses, and other frontline workers across the country, said Bonnie Castillo, executive director of NNU and a registered nurse. Now is not the time to relax protective measures, and we are outraged that the CDC has done just that while we are still in the midst of the deadliest pandemic in a century. The union Union expressed particular concern for how the new guidance would leave public facing workers, including grocery store employees and healthcare workers, vulnerable, as business establishments will have no way of making sure unmasked people are vaccinated against the coronavirus. Quote, people have been asking us, I don't understand. How am I going to know if the person next to me is not masked because they're fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, refused to be vaccinated, have conditions that don't allow them to be vaccinated, said Gene Ross, co-president of NNU, in a video the group released Sunday. 
well, we share that confusion. And I tend to agree with National Nurses United. I get that you want to incentivize mask wearing, right? But there are other ways to do that. If that's actually the CDC's intent here, I mean, you can have incentives to where you give people a tax break or in, uh, I think it's Ohio uh, or Oklahoma. No, I think it's Ohio. They're offering to enroll people who get vaccinated in a lottery and they're giving uh, five residents a million dollars each. I think that things like this are important. But for something like this, especially when you offer a little to no guidelines and you just say people who are fully vaccinated no longer have to wear masks, this could backfire. Because again, not everyone can get vaccinated and not everyone who wants to be vaccinated is fully vaccinated yet, including children. So in an interview with CNN, the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, was asked about this. Like, what does this mean for people with children who are afraid that people will abuse the honor system, inevitably so, and maybe endanger their kids. And her answer didn't provide much clarity. Let's just get practical here. Is it safe for that unvaccinated child, even in a mask, to be in a grocery store when people around them could be unmasked and not following the honor system because they're not vaccinated? Thank you for that question. We were going to be at this period of time. We knew that there was going to be a time where we had the majority of Americans who wanted to be vaccinated, vaccinated, and yet the children were not going to be eligible um, yet. And we are working really hard. Let's celebrate the fact that this week we also got news that we can vaccinate our 12 to 15 year olds. We hope by the fall, by the, um, by the end of this year, we'll have vaccine eligible, uh, kids eligible at even younger ranges. And what we're saying is those kids should continue to wear a mask in those settings. We recognize the challenge of parents who can't leave their kids at home should be masked in those settings and to the best of their ability to keep a distance. Those, the recommendations for those settings have not changed. And do you trust that people who are not vaccinated, given what we've seen over the past year plus, will actually keep their masks on? You know, I think that people who were not inclined to wear a mask were not inclined to wear a mask before Thursday. But some of them were mandated to do so, and those mandates are lifting in part because of your new guidelines. Yes, and what we're really asking in those settings is to say, in terms of the honor system, people have to be honest with themselves. You're protected if you're vaccinated. You're not if you're not vaccinated. But again, not everyone is fully vaccinated. And this is the same CDC director who just a month or so ago warned of impending doom because of a rise in cases. Now I get cases are down, vaccinations are up, and the vaccines work. That's great news. But the question is, how do you enforce something like this when we don't know who is and isn't vaccinated? An honor system very clearly isn't going to work in a country of people who have been lying and raised issues with the mask mandates. But I mean, sure, it makes sense to want to incentivize uh, the vaccines by saying, look, your life can kind of return to normal if you get vaccinated. It's just this raises so many questions that aren't answered by the CDC, which is why I'm inclined to believe that what they did here is irresponsible. Now, what happened over the weekend was many retailers such as Costco and Walmart did, in fact, just lift the mask mandates and um, asked whether or not the CDC anticipated this happening. Rochelle Walensky didn't really give an answer. She just basically evaded the question. Did you mean for this guidance to result in stores and local governments lifting those mask mandates? Good morning, Dana. Thanks for having me. I think we should just take a moment and pause and celebrate where we are in this moment. Um, you know, cases have come down by about a third just in the last two weeks. Our death, death rates are as low as they have been since April of 2020. So, and vaccines are available and eligible. Everyone is eligible above the age of 12. So um, we have a plenty of vaccine and the science as you just conveyed demonstrate that they work. And so that is what allowed us to make this guidance at the individual level. This was a first step. It was a foundational guidance. Everybody is really thinking about what this means now at this moment, 16 months later, as we really think about opening up. And we needed to sort of set this foundation based in the science to make sure people understood as they make their recommendations moving forward. And we are doing the hard work with them to make those recommendations. Yeah, and I understand what you mean about a first step, but can you see, since this is uh, big news for every American, uh, can you see how your guidance that vaccinated people can take their masks off but requirements from businesses, local governments, 
to keep the masks on are sending a mixed message? Here's what I know. I know that we need to do the hard work. This was individual guidance to understand what this means for communities, what this means for businesses. We know at the individual level, the vaccinated people are safe. More than one third of Americans have been vaccinated, over 45% of adults above the age of 18. Those people are safe when they get vaccinated, after they're fully vaccinated. For those who are unvaccinated, we're really asking those businesses to work hard to make sure that they have um, uh, available vaccine for those people so that they have time off, so paid time off, so that they can get their employees vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And for those people, we really are asking them to get vaccinated or wear a mask to keep themselves safe. So we're relying on the honor system, not just at the individual level, but at the business level as well. We're supposed to assume that businesses, out of the kindness of their hearts, will allow their employees to take some time off to get vaccinated and perhaps take a couple of days off after their second dose if they experience side effects. I mean, do you understand why this is so confusing? And let me just say, the CDC director should be clear, should answer questions as clearly as possible, not evade questions like a politician. So this is really frustrating to me because, again, I, I kind of see why the CDC would do this to incentivize people to take the vaccine. And it's based in science. If you're vaccinated, you're good. You're basically able to resume your activities as you did before the pandemic. But at the same time, what I'm worried about are the people who are inevitably going to abuse this system, who refuse to get vaccinated and don't want to wear a mask. Of course, they're just going to lie and say, yeah, I'm vaccinated. Mask comes off. Cases continue to spread because of folks like this and individuals who aren't yet fully vaccinated, individuals who are immunocompromised can't get the vaccine. Then they have to pay the price. It's just, it feels, it feels weird. There should have been more clarification with this statement. And again, I am not a public health official, so feel free to disregard any and everything that I'm saying right now, but I'm just sharing my opinion. I think that what should have happened was they should have delayed this new guideline at least for a month or so. So that way, anyone who finally became eligible, the general population as of April 19th, would be fully vaccinated when this goes into effect. It is the case that if you're fully vaccinated, you don't really have to worry about this. But there's a lot of folks who still kind of do have to worry about unmasked people spreading their germs. People like my nephew, who just turned 18, and got the vaccine, but he's not yet vaccinated. He'll get his second shot in the beginning of June, I believe. And then two weeks after that, around mid-June, he'll be fully vaccinated. I mean, what about these people? And to me, my issue with this is that masks are the easiest, most convenient thing we can do to stop the spread of the virus. So are they really that big of an impediment to our daily lives and routines that you have to issue this new directive right now? Again, it is based on the science. I don't agree with the statement by NNU that this isn't based on science necessarily, because it is. Studies show that the vaccines are highly effective in the real world, and that if you have the vaccine, you're less likely to spread the disease to other individuals. But at the same time, it just seems like this is a little bit too early. But I mean, what do I know? I'm just an individual, and I just want us to get through this. So whatever we can do to actually permanently get through this, I'm all for that. It's just that this doesn't seem all that thought out especially when the CDC was overly cautious for months and then they just change it on a dime like that. I don't, I don't get it. It's frustrating and I think it's irresponsible at a minimum for the CDC to just do this, make this new announcement and then absolutely <laughs> provide us with nothing in terms of what we're supposed to do to enforce this. It's, it's, uh, it's not good. <laughs> we'll, just, we'll, we'll put it like that and leave that there. Now that conservatives have a comfortable 6-3 to three majority on the Supreme Court, take a guess as to what is one of the first things that's on the chopping block. Of course, it's Roe v. Wade. And the Supreme Court will indeed be hearing a case about abortion. So as Politico reports, the Supreme Court announced on Monday that it will reconsider the right to an abortion it established almost 50 years ago, agreeing to review Mississippi's ban on the procedure after 15 weeks of pregnancy. 
The court's decision to take a case directly challenging Roe v. Wade, the landmark 1973 decision that legalized abortion nationwide, suggests that the court's new 6-3 conservative majority is ready to eliminate or, more likely, curtail the right to terminate a pregnancy. In a one-line order, the court said it will review just one question that cuts to the heart of Roe, whether all bans on abortion before a fetus can survive outside the womb are unconstitutional. The Supreme Court will likely hear arguments on the case in the fall, meaning a ruling could come down in summer of 2022, just a few months ahead of midterm elections that will decide party control of the narrowly divided House and Senate. The decision to take the case also sets up a clash between a new presidential administration supportive of abortion rights and red states intent on limiting or banning the procedure outright. Since the Mississippi ban on virtually all abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy was enacted in 2018, it has been blocked by lower courts that have cited Roe's viability standard. Most medical experts believe viability occurs around 24 weeks of pregnancy. Mississippi was part of a wave of Republican-leaning states that passed bans on abortion early in pregnancy in recent years, knowing they would be rejected by lower courts, but hoping they would provide the Supreme Court with the opportunity to revisit the Roe decision. The addition of Justice Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court last fall expanded the bench's conservative majority, raising expectations that the nation's highest court would curtail abortion access. So what states like Mississippi were doing in passing these laws that they knew were unconstitutional was trying to instigate a challenge to Roe v. Wade because, I mean, the court tipped in their favor. And slowly but surely, it was tipping further and further in their favor. Back in 2018, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, they probably knew that she wasn't necessarily healthy and that Amy Coney Barrett could soon replace her or, or some conservative justice could replace her. So they knew exactly what they were doing and now, predictably, the court is going to be revisiting Roe v. Wade. So the question is, will the Supreme Court actually further curtail the rights granted to women under Roe? And the answer is, most likely. If they don't straight up override the precedent of Roe v. Wade, that will actually be surprising. But at a minimum, I expect them to side with Mississippi here. This is what conservatives have been fighting for for a very long time. It's been a rallying point in elections. So we'll see what happens, but this is a, a very bad sign of what's to come. And for those of you who claim to be pro-life, but are also conspicuously silent when it comes to wars, um, I just want to let you know that this isn't actually going to curtail the number of abortions taking place in the United States. What will happen is abortions will continue, but they will continue illegally and unsafely for women. And as a result, we may see more unsafe abortions kill women as a result. Now, sure, this doesn't mean that abortion will automatically be banned in all 50 states. This just means that states can restrict abortion if it is the case that the Supreme Court does indeed overrule the precedent set by Roe v. Wade. But I mean, let's say hypothetically speaking, they overrule Roe v. Wade. How long until we see like a dozen, two dozen states possibly just outright ban abortion? Probably immediately. Probably immediately. So this is a very, very bad sign. And um, if Democrats aren't serious about packing the Supreme Court or in introducing a constitutional amendment to codify the right to an abortion into law, which isn't going to pass either, then we may just watch disaster unfold. And that's a really scary thought. But this is not necessarily surprising, given the, uh, given the makeup of the Supreme Court. If you've been following my coverage of the Israeli massacre in Gaza, you know that I am very dissatisfied with Joe Biden's predictably terrible response here and his unconditional support to Israel as they carry out war crimes and an ethnic cleansing in Palestine. But thankfully, now things are starting to change. I stated in a different video that it kind of feels as if we're at a turning point where the tide is turning in favor of Palestinian human rights and the excuses that individuals who vociferously defend Israel used to use are no longer persuasive. And better yet, we have a member of Congress who is Palestinian, who is actually able to challenge power in a way that we've never seen before. Now, Rashida Tlaib, Palestinian-American lawmaker, actually confronted Joe Biden to his face and called out his unconditional support to Israel. 
And Luke Broadwater and Nicholas Vandos of the New York Times write about this, saying Representative Rashida Tlaib, Democrat of Michigan, confronted President Biden on Tuesday over his support for Israel amid its bombing campaign against Hamas in Gaza, urging him to stop enabling a government she said was committing war crimes against Palestinians, according to a Democratic aide familiar with the exchange. During a conversation on a tarmac in Detroit, where Mr. Biden had arrived to visit a Ford factory near her congressional district, Ms. Tlaib echoed a scathing speech she delivered last week on the House floor, telling the president that he must do more to protect Palestinian lives and human rights, said the aide, who spoke on the condition of anonymity to describe her remarks. Ms. Tlaib, who could be seen making her case to Mr. Biden as she greeted him at the steps of Air Force One, told the president that the status quo was only enabling more killing and that his current policy of unconditional support for the Israeli government under Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was not working, the aide said. Mr. Biden shook Ms. Tlaib's hand after the conversation and later praised the congresswoman during his public remarks at the factory in Dearborn. And if you want to know what he said, here's the video. I'm Rashid Tlaib. Where's Rashid? I tell you what, Rashid, I want to say to you that uh, I admire your intellect. I admire your passion and I admire your concern for so many other people. And it's my from my heart. I pray that your grandma and family are well. I promise you I'm going to do everything to see that they are on the West Bank. You're a fighter, and God, thank you for being a fighter. Okay. First of all, her name is Rashida, not Rashid. Second of all, you're the president of the United States. Stop praying. Nobody wants to hear about your thoughts and prayers. Start acting by picking up the phone and threatening to cut off aid to Israel. Just like that. It really is that easy. You can exert the pressure that you have as a leader to stop this, but you're not doing that. And because the Israeli government knows that they have the U.S.'s unconditional support, Benjamin Netanyahu has gotten more brazen than ever, bombing Gaza's sole COVID-19 testing lab and butchering top doctors, further exacerbating the humanitarian crisis that they've already created in Gaza. And that's not even including... Israel bombing a building that housed AP journalists. So spare me. I don't care about your thoughts and prayers. You're the president of the United States. You have the power to act and you're choosing to not act. You've expressed support for a ceasefire, but you refuse to demand a ceasefire unequivocally. And because that's the case, Israel will continue to commit this massacre, commit atrocities in Gaza. In fact, news broke just as I record this, that uh, the Israeli government vows to continue their slaughter of Gaza. So it's really infuriating to see politicians who are in positions of power, especially the president, talk about thoughts and prayers. Nobody wants to hear about your thoughts and prayers. Take action. Stop the bloodshed. Use your power and the executive branch's power to do something. But he's not doing it. So, I mean, it's a little ridiculous that the president of the United States, after a member of Congress who's Palestinian begged and pleaded with him, I mean, all he offered was a prayer. It's embarrassing, honestly. He should be embarrassed. That's a terrible response. Now, this is the reaction to an event that took place near Joe Biden's speech. Um, there's many solidarity with Palestine events going on. One of them was in Detroit, and this was the reaction to Joe Biden appearing in their city as he's permitting Israel to do genocide in Gaza. Let me say, the president is down the street right now. He's down in the south end of Dearborn. He thinks he can just walk into Dearborn. They have shut down the whole south end to make sure that nobody could get close to him, that nobody could let him know how we feel. We have over a thousand people here today. I don't know much about physics, I don't know much about sound, but I know the South End is that way. So can everyone look that way and with the loudest voice you can say, Free, free Palestine! 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 Joe Biden is going to hear us today one way or the other. Again, that was one of many Palestinian solidarity protests taking place around the world right now. So it's nice to see people step up and speak out finally 
and get on the right side of history and condemn Israeli apartheid and the ethnic cleansing and genocide that they're carrying out currently in Palestine. Uh, but back to uh, Rashida Tlaib, I absolutely commend her. I I'm thankful that we have her voice in Congress to actually speak out, to represent the plight of the Palestinian people, to actually have family in West Bank, uh, to, to plead their case. We never had this before. And it's really important to have that representation in Congress, especially now. So people like the president don't just have one side in his ear. They, they actually get a little bit of pushback. Joe Biden actually hears from Palestinians, from a Palestinian at least, I should say, who's not just going to accept the same tired excuses that we've been hearing for decades at the, as the United States permits Israel to commit these atrocities. Richard Gonzalez is the CEO of a pharmaceutical company called AbbVie. Now, this company manufactures two drugs with which they raised the cost of just last year. One of these drugs is an anti-inflammatory and another is a drug used to treat cancer. Yeah, and I'm sure that you'll be surprised to find out that in 2020, the year where a pandemic ravaged the world and is still here with us today, he made $24 million, which is an 11% pay raise. Now, he went before the House Oversight and Reform Committee, and Representative Katie Porter pressed him to explain why they raise the cost of uh, these drugs, especially during a pandemic when people are struggling. And she basically got him to inadvertently admit that the justification that his company gave was a lie. So she tweeted out, Big Pharma says they need to charge astronomical prices to pay for research and development. Yet, the amount they spend on manipulating the market to enrich shareholders completely eclipses what's spent on research and development. Today, I confronted a CEO about the industry's lies with visuals. And as you're going to see here, what she did was masterful. Enjoy. Mr. Gonzalez, how much did you spend, did Abby spend on litigation and settlements from 2013 to 2018? Uh, I, I don't have that number off hand. We'll be happy to give it to you. Okay, $1.6 billion, $2.45 billion on R&D, $1.6 billion in litigation and settlements. What about marketing and advertising? How much does Abby spend on that? Uh, well, marketing and advertising, we spend about $4 billion a year. Yep, $4.71 billion. How about executive compensation, 2013 to 2018? 2013 to 2018, it's probably on average about $60 million a year. Try 334 on for size. Now, how much did Avi spend on stock buybacks and shareholders, stock, stock buybacks and dividends to enrich your shareholders from 2013 to 2018? Well, stock buybacks, if you actually look at just poor stock buybacks, it would be about $13 billion. Stock buybacks uh, and dividends is the question, sir. Uh, dividends that have to come back with that, a number for that over that period of time. Fifty billion dollars. So, Mr. Gonzalez, you're spending all this money to make sure you make money rather than spending money to invest in, develop drugs, and help patients with affordable, life-saving drugs. You lie to patients when you charge them twice as much for an unimproved drug, and then you lie to policymakers when you tell us that R&D justifies those price increases. The big pharma fairy tale is one of groundbreaking R&D that justifies astronomical prices. But the pharma reality is that you spend most of your company's money making money for yourself and your shareholders. And the fact that you're not honest about this with patients and with policymakers, that you're feeding us lies, that we must pay astronomical prices to get innovative treatments is false. The American people, the patients, deserve so much better. I yield back. That was incredible, and that last line was so good that I have to read it again. Quote, the big form of fairy tale is one of groundbreaking research and development that justifies astronomical prices, but the form of reality is that you spend most of your company's money making money for yourself and your shareholders. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. They try to justify gouging their customers by saying, you know, we have to raise the cost because producing and manufacturing all of these drugs, discovering new ways to treat illnesses, this all costs money. But as she stated, they spent $2.45 billion on research and development, whereas they spent $50 billion 
on stock buybacks and dividends. Completely exposed as liars. And this is how you do it. This is how it's done. This isn't the first time that Katie Porter has exposed the CEO, but every time she does it, it's just, it's brilliant because they walk right into her trap. They never come prepared. And part of the reason why they always end up getting cornered here is because they have no justification, right? They raise the cost, but it's not like this medication is getting better. They always try to come up with some excuse and it's never, ever convincing. And now you know why. It's because they don't have any legitimate reasons to gouge their customers. It's all about making money. We know that they're not using the additional revenue by gouging customers to put that into research and development. They're just enriching their shareholders and themselves. Again, that CEO, Richard Gonzalez, made $24 million in 2020 in a year during a worldwide pandemic where a lot of people lost their jobs around the globe. That individual got an 11% pay raise. How? By raising the cost of drugs people need, by gouging customers who rely on on his company's medication. It's truly morally reprehensible. And this is why we can't have a healthcare industry in America. All of these things, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, hospitals, they have to be decommodified because so long as it's a money-making venture, the goal isn't going to be to treat patients. The goal is going to be to make money, to increase profits, to increase shareholder value. In fact, Goldman Sachs notoriously asked whether or not curing patients is a sustainable business model that goes to show you that they don't care about helping people. They just want to make money. So you manufacture a really good drug that people need to survive or perhaps to live their life somewhat manageably or normally. And then uh, what do you do? You raise the price because you know that they need it. Preying on people, quite literally. It's, it's just morally reprehensible. Honestly, companies like this they need to be nationalized because they've proven that they're not looking out for, for the public good. And sure, it's the systems that are in place that incentivize this sort of behavior. But again, with, with no adequate regulations that rein them in, then this is going to continue to happen. And the issue is that the regulations imposed on these companies, they're mere inconveniences. They get a slap on the wrist. You know, sometimes it's more cost efficient to just break the law or, you know, break regulations, pay the fine, and then uh, do what makes you the most money. That's what a lot of companies do. That's how they operate. Not necessarily in this context. I'm not accusing this individual or this company of breaking the law, but certainly what they're doing is unethical and it needs to be reined in legislatively. Okay, so we are going to play a little bit of a game. So I'm going to read you a quote and then I want you to guess who said it. Here's the quote. You can never be woke enough. That's the problem. It keeps going. It keeps going further and further and further down the line. And if you get to the point where you capitulate, where you agree to all these demands, it'll eventually get to straight white men who are not allowed to talk. So the question is, who is it that said this? Is it A, Bill O'Reilly, former Fox News host? B, Rush Limbaugh, dead radio show host? Or C, Joe Rogan, host of the Joe Rogan Experience on Spotify? I'll give you a few seconds to kind of think it over, guess who said it, and uh, here's the answer. You can never be woke enough. That's the problem. It keeps going. It keeps right. going further and further and further down the line. And if you get to the point where you capitulate, where you agree to all these demands, it will eventually get to straight white men are not allowed to talk. Right. Because it's your privilege to express yourself when other people of color have been silenced throughout history. It, it will be, you're not allowed to go outside because so many people were imprisoned for so many years. I mean, I'm not joking. No, I, I know, I know. It really will get there. It's that crazy. You yeah. know, we just got to be nice to each other, man. And th there's a lot of people that are taking advantage of this weirdness in our culture, and then that becomes their thing. Their thing is calling people out for their privilege, calling people out for their position. You know, it's, uh, it's fucking crazy times. I'm sure that the irony is completely lost on him because as right wing cope on Twitter points out, he's complaining about straight white men eventually not being able to talk while he as a straight white man was paid $100 million from Spotify literally to talk. I mean, does he, does he even acknowledge how ridiculous he sounds? It's actually straight white men like Joe Rogan who are the real victims in American society.
definitely think that Joe Rogan's the victim. I'm sure that every day he cries himself to sleep in his mansion because of how much of a victim he is. And, you know, perhaps he, uh, you know, needs to get his mind off of his victimhood by playing some tennis on his uh, home tennis court or swimming in his uh, in-ground pool that I'm sure he has in his backyard. I mean, this is this is clearly idiotic. And the reason why at the beginning of the video I, you know, made you guess between who actually said this is because Joe Rogan sounds a lot like a lot of right-wing ideologues who say the same thing, who propagate this claim that actually it's it's white men who are the victims in America, not marginalized communities, not American workers. So Owen Higgins on Twitter shared two articles that sound eerily similar to what Joe Rogan is saying here. Bill O'Reilly complained that the left aka the woke mob, wants power taken away from the white establishment. And now dead radio show host Rush Limbaugh claimed that white privilege is a liberal construct. And now we have Joe Rogan, a supposedly apolitical self-identified idiot, saying the same thing, basically. Parroting the same points that right-wing ideologues have been making for decades. It's just a new package and a new person saying the same thing that we've been hearing. And honestly, I wasn't necessarily that taken aback by Joe Rogan saying this because I didn't necessarily think that he was being literal, right? And even his guest laughed because he didn't necessarily think that Joe Rogan was being serious as he complained about straight white men not being allowed to talk. But he, he confirmed he was serious. He said, uh, no, I'm not joking. It really will get there. So he confirmed that his argument was in fact literal. He believes... It is literally the case that we'll get to a point where straight white men won't be allowed to talk. You're supposed to cede all of your talking time to marginalized communities. He doesn't even persuasively argue against the straw man that he created. What marginalized communities want, the demands that they're asking for, and I don't know if he had a particular group in mind, he often shits on trans people, so maybe he was talking about them, but what people want isn't to replace white people at the top of the social hierarchy. What they're calling for is the abolition of the social hierarchy altogether so there can be equality. They don't want to make you their subordinates. They don't want to make you a second-class citizen. They just want equality. That's literally all that they want. By and large, civil rights movements are always criticized in this way. It's just that the argument changes a little bit. You use synonyms for words that they used before. I mean, do you think that in the civil rights era, conservatives back then or apolitical people were thinking, wow, the, these you know black Americans who are calling for an end to segregation, they seem perfectly reasonable. And, you know, I don't think that this is going to make me a second class citizen. No. Whites literally argued that if blacks got equal rights, that would be discrimination against them. We still see this argument trotted out against the LGBTQ community. Just a couple of weeks ago, I covered a segment from Mike Huckabee's program where he claimed that the Equality Act isn't actually about equality. Actually, it's about subjugating Christian Americans to second-class citizenship. Because if they're no longer allowed to discriminate against LGBTQ people... They are therefore being discriminated against. They're the new people who are the victims. And this is the same argument being made by somebody who's more persuasive than an idiot like Bill O'Reilly or Rush Limbaugh, who's dead, or Mike Huckabee. But here we are. Joe Rogan is continuing down this path of being just a full-blown conservative right-winger. It's pretty sad. But what's really sad is the fact that he has influence on a lot of people. I don't necessarily care about Joe Rogan's political ideology. He's a multi multi millionaire. If you have more than a hundred million dollars, then I think you're gonna be out of touch. That just comes with the money. But what's sad is that people still take Joe Rogan seriously. So people who are apolitical or don't necessarily know better, they might actually be persuaded by Joe Rogan's argument because he's the one making the argument. You know, when Rush Limbaugh or Bill O'Reilly makes this argument, people can easily deduce that these are right-wing talking heads, they're hacks, they're not objective. But when Joe Rogan says it, they think, oh, well, Joe Rogan's saying it, so it must be true. And it's pretty sad. All that marginalized people are asking for is to be treated with dignity, be treated with respect, and be given equal rights, not more rights than anyone else. Nobody is making this argument.
So whatever woke mob he's referring to, again, we don't have the full context. I don't know what group in particular he was referring to. Perhaps he was reacting to an article or a particular protest. I don't know. But still, overall, for him to say that it's literally going to be the case that straight white men won't be allowed to talk in this country while he gets paid $100 million to talk? I mean, how can anyone take him seriously after this? The answer is, they should not. And Joe Rogan is a fucking clown. Even though now the U.S. influence over Latin America is starting to wane, back in 1973 when Chile elected a socialist government and elected socialist president Salvador Allende, we backed a coup and overthrew that government. And that led to one of the most harshest, brutal authoritarian regimes ever. And even though Augusto Pinochet is no longer in control in Chile, his legacy remains. And his legacy wasn't just of authoritarianism, it was also a legacy of neoliberalism that was ruthless as well. So as Kenny Stencil of Common Dreams explains, after a U.S.-backed coup toppled Chile's democratically elected socialist president, Salvador Allende, on September 11th of 1973, Pinochet's regime implemented a wave of pro-market policies under anti-democratic circumstances at the behest of economists trained at the University of Chicago. This led to vast inequalities and rendered egalitarian reform exceedingly difficult even in the post-dictatorship period that began in 1990. There have been numerous attempts over the the past 30 years to rein in market fundamentalism in Chile, but because neoliberalism was so deeply embedded in the country's 1980 constitution, the reign of Pinochet's policies outlived the military dictator. And to give you a sense of how terrible it is in Chile, it's often referred to as a laboratory for neoliberalism. All of the policies that we want implemented here in the United States, the neoliberal policies that we want here, that conservatives want here, to be clear, uh, they've been implemented in Chile. For example, the uh, Wall Street executives and big business interests have been trying to privatize Social Security in the United States, but they've met, never been successful at doing that. However, in Chile, that actually did happen. And conservatives always point to Chile as the model for how we should run our social security system, and they continue to do this even as the system in Chile is literally falling apart to the point where hundreds of thousands of protesters took to the streets of Santiago to demand reform. But the good news is that things are starting to change. We are on the cusp of a new dawn in Chile because the policies of Augusto Pinochet may soon come to an end because of what is taking place currently in the country. So Common Dreams continues, during a historic referendum last October, which represented the culmination of a decades-long revolt against the neoliberal model, Chileans voted in a four-to-one landslide to rewrite the dictatorship-era constitution. Notably, voters chose for the new constitution to be written by a popularly elected assembly of constituents rather than a mixed assembly of politicians and citizens. At the time, political theorist Melanie Cruz called the overwhelmingly popular support for a new constitution Constitution, a chance to bury Pinochet's legacy and rebuild the country on a truly democratic basis. Still, the question remained, who would be in charge of the process? Which of the more than 1,300 candidates would be selected for this monumental task? During this past weekend's election, originally scheduled for April, would push back due to an increase in coronavirus infections, Chileans were finally given a chance to answer that question definitively. Of the 155 citizens elected to the Constituent Assembly, only 38, which is less than a quarter, came from the right-wing coalition known as Vamos por Chile. By delivering a knockout blow to the country's right wing, voters ensured that that a large majority of the 155 delegates responsible for establishing a new political framework at the Constituent Assembly will be bringing progressive perspectives rather than neoliberal orthodoxy to the table, increasing the likelihood that a genuinely emancipatory constitution gets created. Greg Grandin, a world-renowned historian of Latin America, tweeted, Allende is smiling. Alluding to neoliberalism, Grandin added that it started in Chile, it will end in Chile. So finally, after multiple decades, only now, Chile is finally starting to undo the damage that we caused by supporting a coup d'etat that ousted their democratically elected socialist president back in the 1970s. And it's not just that neoliberalism will be going the way of the Dota, hopefully. Um, we'll have to wait and see what constitution they craft. But it's also the case that Currently in Chile, they have some of the most restrictive laws related to abortion in the world. So social equality is also going to be a thing that gets promoted 
most likely at this constitutional convention. And in an article for The Guardian, Sharice McGowan argues that this could actually be a game-changing moment for gender equality in Chile. And she writes, in Chile, feminist constitutional candidates stress that parity in the new constitution does not only benefit women, but any minority group that has been excluded from political spaces, including the country's indigenous communities, LGBT groups, and gender non-conforming people. So that sounds incredible, and it gets better. There will be 17 seats allocated to indigenous people. So this truly is a chance for Chile to lead the world now, not in neoliberal policies, not for them to be a laboratory of neoliberalism to export the policies that they produce after testing it there to the United States and other countries. Now is their chance to actually right the wrongs of the Pinochet era and actually form a constitution that benefits the people of Chile. And it's truly, it's honestly remarkable to see the shift in Latin American politics where they're no longer just accepting U.S. influence, no longer accepting what the United States says. Now they're charting their own path and it really is just so inspiring to see. And one more thing I want to share is this tweet from Professor Richard Wolf, who writes, Salute to Chile, rising from the long night since Allende's murder, Pinochet's dictatorship, Milton Friedman's economic policies for the rich. A special bravo to Chile's women pioneering a new constitution. Yeah, and uh, we'll leave that there. So uh, Chile was one of the first Latin American countries that I learned about specifically as it pertains to U.S. intervention and how we backed the coup that ousted the socialist leader that led to a brutal dictatorship. And now to see it all finally change and to see the people of Chile have a chance to have a future, to have a new opportunity. It really is phenomenal to see. So I stand in solidarity with the people of Chile and I'm excited to see the constitution that they craft. Um, they elected the right people. So now we'll see what they come up with, but hopefully this will be a new standard for constitutions throughout the world. Because, you know, if they prove that uh, they can actually chart a new path and respect the rights of indigenous people, marginalized groups and workers, then perhaps now Chile could become a laboratory for democracy and socialism and not neoliberalism. And I can't wait to see what they do. So this story that we're going to talk about is very, very rage-inducing. It made me very angry after reading it. And it's not necessarily something that's shocking, but still when you hear about the specifics, it really is unthinkable. Now, I think that the left has done a really great job at persuasively arguing that healthcare in America should not be commodified, but we don't nearly talk enough about how hospitals as well should not be businesses. Hospitals should prioritize patients and not profits, but in this story, it really reiterates how important it is to more often include hospitals in this discussion about the decommodification of healthcare. Because they do a lot of terrible things that lead to people being harmed, especially when times are tough during a global pandemic that is so bad it only happens usually once a century. So as CNN's Casey Tolan reports, as the coronavirus spiked in Missouri last fall, a wave of cases hit a nursing home in the state's rural heartland. Robin Bull, a part-time nurse, remembered an ambulance coming and going constantly on one especially scary morning, rushing residents to Moberly Regional Medical Center, the local hospital. But even as Bull was helping send patients to Moberly Regional, the hospital was in the process of suing her and at least one other former employee at the nursing home. They were two of more than 600 former patients the hospital has sued over medical bills during the coronavirus pandemic, according to a CNN analysis of court records. Bull's experience is hardly unique. Hospitals owned by Community Health Systems Incorporated, one of America's largest hospital chains, have filed at least 19,000 lawsuits against their patients over allegedly unpaid medical bills since March of 2020, even as other hospitals around the country have moved to curtail similar lawsuits during the coronavirus pandemic, a CNN investigation found. The company's 84 hospitals, which are concentrated in the South and stretch from Alaska to Key West, Florida, have taken their patients to court for as little as $201 and as much as $162,000. They say litigation is a last resort. 
CNN's review of court filings across 16 states the company operates in found that most of the patients sued by CHS, like Bull, didn't hire a lawyer or fight the lawsuits, and judges often ruled in the company's favor by default. In some states, defendants' debts piled on with attorneys' fees and interest. Elsewhere, the hospital chain's subsidiaries quickly moved to garnish defendants' paychecks after a judgment. CHS in 2020 enjoyed its most profitable year in at least a decade. Even as it was suing patients during the pandemic, the company made $511 million in net income last year, a big swing after four straight years of annual losses. That strong financial result led to the company's top executives earning millions of dollars worth of bonuses, according to documents it has filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. One reason for the success, CHS has been buoyed by taxpayer support. It received $705 million in pandemic-related aid from the federal government's CARES Act and other state and local programs in 2020, not including additional government loans it will have to pay back, according to its 2021 annual report to shareholders. Okay, let's step back and review all of the details here. They are suing thousands and thousands of patients during a pandemic in a year when they actually saw increases to their revenue after they took taxpayer money. Could they get any more brazen? I don't think they could get any more brazen if they tried. And the reason why they usually win by default, as the article referenced, is because normal working Americans, they can't afford to fight this legally. Having a lawyer who's good to represent you, it costs money. You know, for paperwork, court documents, there are legal fees associated with that. So a lot of people, they just, they can't fight it. So what happens? The court ends up uh, rewarding the hospital who's suing them, who actually has the resources to take on these individuals. It's a power imbalance and it's unjust, oh, unjust, and this is an injustice that has been happening forever in America. It's just that even as bad as these businesses called hospitals can be sometimes, at least some of them during a pandemic said, okay, maybe we won't harass people too much who can't afford medical bills. But not this hospital chain. I, it's just shocking. Like reading the details, it's almost unbelievable, but it's totally predictable in our late stage capitalist society. But at the same time, the details are still very shocking. Like I never, as much as this is normalized in America, I never feel as if, oh, sure. That's just the thing that happens in America. That's just the way it is. It's still rage inducing because they're so shameless. Hospitals like this need to be nationalized immediately. Because they very clearly are showing you that they don't care about their patients. They care about profits. They're like a mafia. They treat you. You owe them for the rest of your life. You're in debt to them. And in the UK, it isn't this way. There are some privately run hospitals in the UK, but a lot of hospitals are actually publicly owned. So that means that doctors and nurses, they're actually government employees. Now, again, not all hospitals in the UK, but we don't even really have that as an option in the US. I mean, the closest thing is uh, the VA medical system for veterans, but we need to at least see an increase in publicly owned hospitals. And Bernie Sanders is on the right track in, in pushing for more community run health centers. But I mean, with the way the system is currently, we're going to continue to see this happening. Now, what would alleviate some of the pain that people are feeling is if we had a single-payer system. So rather than sending all of these gigantic astronomical bills to the individuals, it just gets sent to the one insurance company representing all of America, the United States government. It's why we need Medicare for all. It's why we have to nationalize a good portion of hospitals in the United States. We can start with this chain. So, you know, for me, I always talk about Medicare for all, but I think that's the start. And then you build on Medicare for all after that. You slowly but surely turn the United States healthcare system into a more national healthcare system that we see in the UK, which is loved by British people. Just ask them. So, I mean, I'll leave that there. I think that the details of the story speak for itself. How shameless this, this company is. It's not surprising, but still the details are shocking because during a pandemic, you know, when other money-making companies, when other hospitals are choosing to give patients a break, not this chain. They're going full speed ahead, suing 
thousands of patients. It's just, it's unthinkable. During a year when they actually saw their revenue increase, it's just, it's awful. There's nothing left to say. It's just awful that this is happening. President Joe Biden has been predictably terrible when it comes to pressuring the Israeli government to stop slaughtering Palestinian civilians. But thankfully, senior House Democrats actually decided to do the right thing and exert pressure on Joe Biden to suspend the weapons deal currently slated to go through because it's a little bit of a bad look if you know especially now those weapons are going to be used against innocent civilians. However, senior House Democrats backed away from that. Yeah, I don't know if the Israeli lobby got to them and, you know, got them to have a change of heart. I don't know if they got cold feet or felt like that effort wasn't going to amount to anything since Joe Biden isn't going to budge. Either way, senior House Democrats decided to be cowards. But thankfully, newer members of Congress, members of the squad, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib and others, are stepping up. Politico reports a group of lawmakers is cobbling together an effort to block a controversial sale of precision-guided weapons to Israel as President Joe Biden ratchets up the pressure on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to bring to a halt the increasingly deadly conflict in Gaza. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is leading the effort along with Representatives Rashida Tlaib, Mark Pocan, Ilhan Omar, and others, according to a draft resolution obtained by Politico. The 11th hour Democratic effort comes one day after a group of senior House Democrats on Tuesday backed off an emerging push to delay the sale amid intensifying violence in the region. Lawmakers wanted to use the impending arms transfer as leverage to push the Israelis to drop their resistance to a ceasefire. Earlier Wednesday, Biden told Netanyahu that he expected a significant de-escalation today on the path to a ceasefire, according to a White House readout of their phone conversation. Last week, the U.S. blocked efforts by the United Nations Security Council to call for a ceasefire, effectively backing Israel's bombing camp against Hamas, the Palestinian militant group. As of Wednesday, Israel's military operations in Gaza have killed 217 Palestinians, including 63 children, while 12 Israelis have died in the conflict, which escalated after Hamas launched thousands of rockets into Israel. Now I'll just pause here to correct that article. The conflict escalated when Israel chose to do an ethnic cleansing in Sheikh Jarrah. They're the ones who initiated all of this. They're the occupiers. They're the aggressor. So I still think it's important to point that out whenever we see this sort of false equivalence or both sidesism in these sorts of articles. But the point of the article stands that now, thankfully, we have members of Congress, members of the squad, who are actually doing the right thing. Now, on Twitter, AOC explained a little bit more about what her goal is, saying the United States should not be rubber stamping weapons sales to the Israeli government as they deploy our resources to target international media outlets, schools, hospitals, humanitarian missions, and civilian sites for bombing. We have a responsibility to protect human rights. It must be said here, amplification is necessary, but not sufficient. Traction on the issue is very dependent on your calls to Congress. Retweets aren't enough. Call your member of Congress and let them know how you'd like to be represented on this matter. Some tips on calling congressional offices. One, don't be scared. Our lines exist to receive your calls. Two, call your member, the one who represents your district. Look it up in the link above. Be kind and clear. You can firmly state your position without being cruel. So she's correct. It's not scary. And to show you how it isn't intimidating, I'm going to call... In a second, I'll call my representative. Uh, but I just want to respond to some of the things that she said here. Like, she specifically cited how Israel is very brazen. They're targeting media outlets. They damaged the road leading to Gaza's main hospital. And if you watched uh, Vosh's 27-hour live stream where he fundraised for the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund, uh, as he was doing the live stream, their building was bombed. It's just they're so brazen bombing these types of humanitarian groups who are literally there to provide medical assistance to Palestinian children. So Israel doesn't care at all. They have no regard for human life. And it's funny, in the article, it cited how Biden, um, his message to uh, Netanyahu was, I expect significant de-escalation. Okay, but what are you going to do about that? Because he's going to hear you and say, okay, thank you very much for your input and continue doing exactly what he's been doing. The way that you actually get him to stop, if you want your words to have any teeth whatsoever, is you have to condition aid, 
You stop the arms sale. I mean, it's not that difficult. Biden has leverage. He's choosing to not use that leverage. Hence why Netanyahu isn't just continuing with the slaughter in Gaza. They're being brazen, openly committing war crimes, bombing a building that housed Associated Press journalists. So it is important. This is going to be very difficult. I don't have much hopes that this resolution is going to pass. Having said that, though, that doesn't mean that we don't try. So I'm going to call my representative. Her name is Suzanne Bonamici. I'm not going to put her number on the screen as I usually do when I call politicians because I don't want you to call my politician. I want you to call your representative. So I'm going to give uh, her a call to her local office. Thank you for calling Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici's Beaverton office. Out of an abundance of caution and in the interest of everyone's health, the Congresswoman's offices in Washington, D.C. and Oregon are closed while the Congresswoman and her staff work remotely. We will be checking this voicemail regularly and returning calls. Please leave a brief message along with your phone number and email address. The Congresswoman's website is available at bonamici.house.gov. Hello, Representative Bonamici. My name is Michael Figueredo. I am a constituent of yours, and I just want to call to encourage you to support Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's resolution urging the Biden administration to not sell weapons to Israel while they literally carry out a genocide in Gaza. I would love to have you be a leader on this issue and not only support that, but also speak up at the behest of Palestinians who right now are suffering. They can't get in or out of Gaza without Israel's say. Israel controls their electricity, their water supply, and currently they're being massacred with 63 children dead because of Israel at the time I make this call. So please, I ask you to support this resolution and be a leader, speak up. It's the right thing to do. And you will be on the right side of history if you do that. Thank you very much for your consideration. And that's it. I mean, I usually end up babbling on far too long when I call a member of Congress or my representative. Um, but you don't have to do that. You could just keep it short and sweet. You can just say, hi, my name is blank. My phone number is blank. Uh, please support AOC's resolution condemning the arms sale to Israel. That's all you really need to say. It's not difficult. And when she says it's not scary, it's surprising. The number of people who actually say they are a little bit afraid to call is a bit startling to me. And um, a lot of people have social anxiety, and sometimes it helps if they see individuals like me do something really simple and just make a call. And I've gotten a lot of great feedback uh, from people who say that when they see me make a call to a member of Congress— they feel a little bit better about doing it themselves. Nine times out of 10, you're never going to talk to an individual. At best, you'll talk to a staffer who will write down your message, and that's it. They'll relay the message to the member of Congress. But it's it's not anything to be afraid of. Um, you know, if you stumble over your own words or you don't necessarily articulate yourself perfectly, that's fine. We're all human beings. What matters is that you get your point across, and it's relatively easy to do that so long as you care about this issue. So I would encourage you to follow AOC's lead here and make the call to your representative. And we will leave that there. Absolute credit where it's due. AOC hasn't necessarily been the best on the issue of Israel-Palestine, but over the course of the last couple of weeks, I have been pleasantly, pleasantly uh, surprised and, and delighted to see the way that she's uh, spoken out on behalf of Palestinian human rights. I'm very happy about this. And um, it's nice to have leaders in Congress now because this is something that's new. We've never had members of Congress really lead the charge against Israeli apartheid. And, and I really want to give her credit because this is uh, things like this, it matters, even if it might be really difficult to actually pass this resolution. There is a seemingly infinite number of issues that need to be addressed, not just in the country, but around the world. However, Republican Party politicians, they're responsibly focusing on the most important issue that currently is plaguing humanity. No, I'm not talking about global anthropogenic climate change. Of course, I'm not talking about the global pandemic that we're all dealing with. I'm speaking 
of the great sauce shortage of 2021. Now, if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this Breitbart article should shed some light on the situation. Quote, Chick-fil-A limits sauces per order due to shortage. Now, in response to this article, U.S. Senator Ted Cruz tweeted out, Joe Biden is destroying America. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, you're a United States senator. <laughs> Ah, now, that's not all, because in response to an article at The Hill about Chick-fil-A's shortage of sauces, QAnon conspiracy theorist and Capitol Insurrection co-conspirator Lauren Boebert responded saying, is there no limit to how awful Biden's America can get? And in addition to her quote tweet, she also responded directly to that article's thread, and she wrote the exact same comment. Um, and the first response is just too perfect because it says, are you going to storm the Capitol in protest? Now, we did manage to capture one video of a public freakout from a Republican who was very outraged at the shortage of sauces. Uh, take a look. I want Szechuan sauce. Where's my Szechuan sauce? I'm Kendall Rick. What will I'm Kendall Rick. 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 Hey, Ted Cruz, this shoe? I'm Ted Cruz. Now, look, I'm sure that you're confused. Maybe it's the case that they're retooling the whole thanks Obama meme, but they're just applying it to Joe Biden. Maybe they're not actually literally blaming Joe Biden for a restaurant chain's sauce shortage. Uh, but no, that they're actually being unironic here. They're literally blaming Joe Biden for Chick-fil-A's sauce shortage. So uh, to give you a little bit more insight into the origins of the story and how this became an issue for the Republican Party, Paul Blessed of Vice News explains Republicans are pinning the blame on President Joe Biden for the gravest crisis currently facing the United States, the great Chick-fil-A sauce shortage of 2021. Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt who is up for re-election next year, sent an email to supporters Monday pointing the finger at Biden over the chicken restaurant supply chain issues, which the company said earlier this month were a result of industry-wide supply chain shortages. Chick-fil-A has a sauce shortage. And you want to know why? Stitt wrote, because of Joe Biden's radical liberal policies. <laughs> The shortages are limiting not only zesty buffalo, oh God, honey mustard and ranch dips. Essentially, every aspect of the global economy from ketchup packets to computer chips has been affected as consumer demands and international supplies were thrown out of whack from the pandemic. And while Biden has pushed for more U.S. companies to manufacture chips in America, there's no word yet on what he's doing about our national condiment emergency. So this is literally something that the Republican Party is trying to make into a thing. They're outraged that they can't get their uh, zesty buffalo sauce from Chick-fil-A, and as a result, they're blaming Joe Biden. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I looked at the email that Kevin Stitt sent out to kind of see if it's as crazy as it sounds. And also, I wanted to know, is there any specific link between Joe Biden and the sauce shortage? And he really doesn't say anything about that in this email. He does allude to the gas shortage that may have something to do with it. And yes, it is the case that there is a gas shortage. But is there a specific policy that Joe Biden's administration has implemented that has led to said gas shortage? Because I do know that a very large gas uh, pipeline was was hacked did joe biden hack it because if so then perhaps he uh shares some culpability there there was a lot of panic buying i guess you could blame joe biden for not issuing a statement calming the masses i just like you're really stretching here you're really going out of your way to try to make joe biden responsible for this when I mean, as president, at the end of the day, you are responsible for everything in the country. But I mean, really, we're going to make the sauce issue a thing that we demonize Biden over. I mean, look, as a leftist, there's virtually unlimited things that you can criticize Joe Biden for. He's an easy target, quite frankly. But they choose sauces at Chick-fil-A. See, this is why 
liberals need to understand what leftists say when we tell you don't take Republicans seriously. Don't try to work with them. There's no sense because they're not serious. The issues that they always raise when it comes to Democratic Party presidents are the dumbest issues imaginable. Does anyone remember the scandal with Obama when he chose to wear a tan suit one day or how he didn't salute a soldier the correct way when he was getting on Air Force One? I can't even remember what the scandal was, but he had a coffee in his hand and he like did a half salute or whatever. And that was apparently a really big deal. There's Benghazi, which is something that they tried to turn into this big controversy. They just, they don't know how to criticize Democrats because they agree with a lot that the Democratic Party does when it comes to economics. They agree on a lot more with the Democrats than even leftists do. So what do they do? They try to manufacture these bizarre scandals in order to get the Democratic Party president, but they, they go for the dumbest of all dumb scandals. I mean, really? Chick-fil-A sauces? I mean, look, let's just assume for a moment that... They're arguing in good faith and they have evidence that I'm not privy to. And Biden really is unilaterally responsible for the great sauce shortage of 2021. Is this really like the main thing that you want to make a big deal out of? Aren't there other things that you can criticize Joe Biden for? I mean, really, this is this is uh, what we're doing. Chick-fil-A sauces can't get your honey mustard. So you're throwing a temper tantrum. Being a Karen on Twitter, Ted Cruz, really? I mean, I, I shouldn't pretend to be surprised because this is very uh, on brand for the Republican Party, but it's just, I don't know. I don't even know what to say. They're melting down over sauces. Okay. <laughs> All throughout the course of the pandemic, I have continued to showcase the hysteria over masks by, let's face it, people who are Republicans. And um, it's not getting any better. Like, we're nearing the end of the pandemic, at least in the United States, as vac vaccinations tick up. But the hysteria over masks is somehow getting dumber as we ease more restrictions. So just Last week, the CDC issued a new guidance, which says people who are not vaccinated, they're the only ones who have to wear masks. So if you get vaccinated, you no longer have to wear a mask indoors. But they're still like ratcheting up the anti-mask rhetoric and the hysteria is getting more bizarre, more hyperbolic and just downright idiotic. So uh, the Blaze TV hosted a conversation between Glenn Beck and Dave Rubin, otherwise known as Rave Dubin. And... Um, I don't even know how to introduce this segment, but basically, Glenn Beck compared anti-maskers to Jewish Germans during the Holocaust. And Dave Rubin then used his Jewish identity to validate what Glenn Beck said, saying, yes, you are correct. This is very much equivalent to the way that Jewish Germans were treated during the Holocaust. I wish I were kidding about this. But this is literally the conversation that they had. Take a look. The absence of a mask on somebody has become almost like a yellow star. Mm -hmm. uh, so many people on the liberal side see the mask as a sign that you're part of the party. And when, you, when you're not wearing a mask, you're a problem. And they've been shaming us. They've been side-eyeing us. Uh, speaking out, calling us names. How do they remove that mask? Because it has become part of the identity of the party. Well, Glenn, that goes directly to the danger that they've been doing for years now, which was calling us all racists and bigots and Nazis. And I know that you personally, you, Glenn, you've gotten into hot water from the, the lefty media at times for making the Nazi analogy. And, and I completely agree with you on this. They are when you make the Nazi analogy, I mean, the irony is these are the people who call all of us Nazis, but the Nazis didn't just show up one day. It didn't yes, just show you. up one day. Oh, it is you, a, yes, it is a process of othering people, saying the worst mm -hmm. things about people. And now it's not just that our political views are odious and should be silenced and kicked off big tech and everything else. It's that we are literally killing people by not wearing masks, by not bowing to these people. Mm -hmm. And and who is who's actually the ones that are instigating the hate? It's it's them. 
honestly, their stupidity never ceases to amaze me. So there's a couple of things that I want to respond to in particular. Can't respond to every single point that they made because we'd be here all day if that were the case. But uh, Glenn Beck says, so many people on the liberal side see the mask as a sign that you're part of a party. Ask yourself why that's the case. Why is that the case, Glenn Beck? Which party politicized masks? Which, uh, which party made it so that way wearing a mask was a political statement? Is it the party that claimed that mask requirements are uh, hurting our liberty? They're infringing on our rights as American citizens? You're the ones who turned this into a political issue, and you're mad now that it's a political issue? Well, stop making everything a partisan issue, numbnuts. He also said, and when you're not wearing a mask, you're part of a problem. And they've been shaming us, side-eyeing us, speaking out, calling us names, because you're literally being childish for refusing to wear a mask in the middle of a pandemic. You're being an imbecile. You're being unreasonable. And I don't believe that every time you go out in public without your mask, you're getting all of these snarls and side eyes from liberals. Everybody just goes on about their business. Nobody cares what you're doing. Like when I'm in a store and I see someone without a mask, I think that that person is stupid and probably a Republican, but I don't ever confront them. I don't snarl at them. I just keep my distance. That's it. But they love being the victims here. They love it. Now, Dave Rubin, after Glenn Beck compared anti-maskers, to the star, uh, he stepped in, of course, to legitimize that idiotic point. He said, uh, look, you've gotten into hot water from the lefty media at times for making the lazy analogy and uh, or the Nazi analogy. Maybe that autocorrected in my notes, but the, the Nazi analogy. And I completely agree with you on this. He then adds, the Nazis didn't just show up one day. It is a process of othering people. It's ironic that you say that because that's literally what Republicans do all the time. Just ask any trans person. But ask yourself this, Dave Rubin. Do you honestly think it's the case that mask mandates are quite literally going to put us on the trajectory of an anti-conservative holocaust? Is that genuinely what you believe, Dave Rubin? Please, like, is this actually the route that you think this is going on? It couldn't possibly be that we're dealing with a pandemic that's so bad it only comes around once every 100 years. It couldn't possibly be that masks are literally just there because it's a pandemic. No, no, no. It's because this is basically like the beginning of the next Holocaust. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no sugarcoating it. Dave Rubin, you were a fucking moron. And Glenn Beck is too. Jesus fucking Christ. I just, you people are so stupid and so unreasonable. It's a piece of cloth. Is it really that big of a deal? Like, I am someone who has glasses. So whenever I wear my mask, I breathe and my glasses fog up. That's a little bit of an inconvenience, but it's still not that big of a deal. It's a pandemic, so it's understandable that this minor inconvenience is something that I have to do throughout the duration of the pandemic, although I've been vaccinated, so not necessarily for much longer. Uh, it's just, they're so unreasonable. And the only response that's appropriate for these imbeciles, is this. <laughs> you are so dumb. You are really dumb. For real. Now, speaking of Marjorie Joker Green, she is a lawmaker who decided to lead a rebellion in the House with other Republican Party politicians against House rules regarding masks. I'm not joking. Politico's Melanie Zanona explains a group of House Republicans revolted over their chamber's mask rules on Tuesday, the latest sign of tensions boiling over as Congress wrestles with how and when to return to pre-pandemic routines. Around a dozen Republicans refused to wear masks during the evening vote series and strategically stood at the well of the chamber, which appears on the C-SPAN cameras and seemed to encourage other members to join in. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene snapped a selfie with a few other maskless members and posted it to social media. Taking pictures on the House floor is against long-standing rules due to security concerns. At one point, Representative Robin came over and confronted the rebellious crew and asked them to be more respectful of other members and staff. Representative Thomas Massey, who was standing nearby, could also be heard shouting to another member in jest, I can't hear you with your mask on. Massey was one of the lawmakers who helped organize the protest, sources said. Earlier in the day, Representative Brian Mast of Florida stood up during a GOP conference 
conference meeting and told his colleagues that he's done wearing masks and will refuse to wear them on the House floor going forward, even if it means being fined, according to multiple sources in the room. And I've got to say that that is definitely not a melodramatic, snowflakey thing to do. It's the Sigma thing to do, actually, to have a public meltdown as a lawmaker because you don't want to wear a piece of cloth over your face during a pandemic. I just, I don't even know what to say. You can probably hear it in my voice. I'm exhausted. Reporting on Republican stupidity so frequently sucks the life out of me. Like, I feel like my soul has been drained from my body because it's like the movie Idiocracy, that wasn't supposed to be a documentary, but Idiocracy, like, I could point to examples in there where I, where I would actually think, you know what? They're probably smarter than some Republican Party pundits and lawmakers. Honestly, it's that bad. If you take them seriously, honestly, and I mean this with all disrespect, that says a lot about your intellect. If you think that these people are serious people, you're stupid. Look, my expectations for Republicans, it's its very low. We'll put it that way. It's, it's below the floor low. But there are some things that you'd think aren't really that controversial, that even seemingly insane people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and the Republican Party have no problem supporting. I mean, some positions that one takes, it's not really supposed to be controversial, right? Um, ice cream is delicious. I think Republicans and Democrats can both agree with that. Cookies are delicious. Dogs are adorable. Um, hatred against the AAPI community is unacceptable. Well, actually, that last statement is an issue because Republicans, uh, 180 Republicans in the House, to be exact, decided to vote against the resolution condemning hate against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community in the United States. Now, for more on this, we go to David Badesh of Raw Story, who explains, Wednesday afternoon, the United States House of Representatives voted 244 to 180 to pass a resolution condemning anti-Asian hate after eight people, including seven Asian Americans, six of whom were women, were shot and killed at spas in Atlanta, Georgia, in a series of hate crime mass shootings last month. All 180 no votes were from Republicans. No Democrats voted against the resolution. Among the no votes were Georgia Republican Representatives Rick Allen, Andrew Clyde, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Jody Heiss, and Barry Loudermilk. Congressman Loudermilk represents part of the area where the killings took place. Jesus. The text is quite simple, condemning the horrific shootings in Atlanta, Georgia on March 16th, 2021, and reaffirming the House of Representatives' commitment to combating hate, bigotry, and violence against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. The resolution says the people of the United States mourn the eight innocent lives lost, seven of whom were women, six of whom were women of Asian descent, and several of whom were immigrants. It lists the victims' names. Emily Tan, Dao Yu Feng, Delena Ashley Yan, Paul Andre Michaels, Yong A Yu, Soon Jung Julie Park, Hyun Jung Grant, and Soon Cha Kim. So I've got to ask, why would you vote against this? Like, what reason can you possibly state that makes it justified to oppose something like this? The only thing I could think of is that while it references a shooting, and if Republicans condemn a mass shooting, then that must tacitly suggest that they support gun control reform. I don't know, but this is a very basic resolution just condemning hate against a community currently under attack, who's seen an increase in hate crimes. Why is it so hard to support the bare minimum? Now, if Matt Gates has taught us anything, usually when... A Republican votes against something that is uncontroversial. It says a little bit about themselves. So, for example, Matt Gates was the only member of Congress to vote against a bill that would further criminalize sex trafficking. And um, here we see 180 Republicans vote against the bill explicitly condemning hate against the AAPI community. So I can only suggest, or deduce rather, that they're taking this position because either... At best, they don't care about hate against the AAPI community, or at worst, they actually don't like the AAPI community. Either way, it's just, this is really, it's shameful to not even do the bare minimum and condemn hatred against a marginalized community 
who has been victimized because of a pandemic that the last president blamed all Asians for, saying it's Kung flu or China virus. He has fueled anti-Asian hate crimes, and the least that Republicans can do is this seemingly symbolic gesture to just support a resolution condemning hate against this community, and they can't even do that. They can't even do that. Jesus Christ. There is no limit to how low they are willing to go to go out of their way to showcase how they are just terrible human beings, and it's truly embarrassing. Look, I don't like conservatives, but back in 2016, 2017, there was a shooting that took place at a Republican baseball game, and it was a Bernie Sanders supporter who carried out the shooting, right? He didn't do this in the name of Bernie Sanders. It's just someone who happened to support Bernie Sanders who did a mass shooting. If I was a member of Congress and there was a resolution condemning this violence against Republican lawmakers, would I support it? Yeah, obviously, because I very clearly don't support violence against Republican lawmakers. It's just these things like this, they shouldn't be partisan issues. Condemning hate against the AAPI community, this shouldn't be a Republican-Democrat thing, but here it is. Everything in our society is a political issue. Wearing masks during a pandemic is a political issue. Believing science is a political issue. Condemning hate against the AAPI community after they just were victims of a mass shooting, that even is a political issue. It's just... With this level of polarization, it, it's it's almost insane. It's like if if Democrats say that ice cream is delicious, how quickly until people like Marjorie Taylor Greene come out and condemn ice cream and say that ice cream is is disgusting and and it's terrible? And Democrats only support ice cream because their donors in the ice cream industry are are, are um, fueling them. Big Ben and Jerry's is paying off Democratic party, party politicians. And I'm being intentionally hyperbolic here, but I mean that's really what it feels like. They're just going out of their way to go against things that Democrats support because Democrats bad. Therefore, any and everything that they propose is bad. To not support a symbolic resolution condemning hate against the AAPI community, that says a lot more about them than anyone else. So by now, I think it's abundantly clear since author J.K. Rowling has made it known every opportunity she, uh, she had that she hates trans women. Okay, we get it. But how obsessed she is with hating trans people, truly, I didn't know the depths of her bigotry. She is, she's out of her mind. Like, she is obsessed with demonizing trans people. And if you also don't agree with her and, and think like her and also think that trans people are uh, some sort of subspecies, especially trans women then uh, she doesn't want to be associated with you. Because Stephen King, another author, who's a better author, by the way, he tells the story of uh, J.K. Rowling canceling him, his words, not mine, for not hating trans people. Yeah. So as Andrew Schuster of Mediaite explains, Stephen King discussed his falling out with fellow author J.K. Rowling after he tweeted his support for trans women. Last year, the Harry Potter author deleted a tweet praising the horror novelist and unfollowed him on the social media platform after he sanctioned a tweet saying, trans women are women. Joe canceled me, King told the Daily Beast in a new interview. She sort of blocked me and all that. Here's the thing. She is welcome to her opinion. That's the way the world works. King continued, if she thinks that trans women are dangerous or that trans women are somehow not women or whatever problem she has with it, the idea that someone masquerading as a woman is going to assault a real woman in the toilet, if she believes all those things, she has a right to her opinion. King went on to tell the Daily Beast that despite the backlash she's received, nobody has canceled J.K. Rowling. He added, she's doing fine. I just felt that her belief was, in my opinion, wrong. We have differing opinions, but that's life. I mean, I did not know she was that obsessed with trans people. That's bizarre. That's really weird. That's really weird. If somebody else doesn't support your bigoted view about trans women, you actually block them on social media. Wow. Now, Stephen King is uh, too nice here. He makes it seem like, well, you know, I know that she doesn't think that trans women are women and she thinks that they are uh, bad people in general and they're predators. But I mean, that's just a difference of opinion. No, that's not a difference of opinion. Some things aren't necessarily a matter of opinion, right? Some people might have the opinion 
that climate change isn't actually man-made. Some people might have the opinion that the pandemic isn't actually real. Some people might have the opinion that racism doesn't exist anymore, that institutional racism isn't a thing. These people are objectively wrong because empirical reality does not support their claims. Trans women are women, period. So he's too nice. Most liberals are. And he's giving her a pass. And he also said, look, you know, she's she's bad on this issue, but she is better on other issues. She's against Donald Trump. Oh, wow. Let's give her an award for being anti-Trump. She was also anti-Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't stand her, and, and I'm not trying to go out of my way to attack Stephen King. I think that it's it's really interesting of him to speak up about this, because usually when, when you're that famous and another famous person kind of comes at you or cancels you, then you might not necessarily feel inclined to speak out if you, if you want to avoid drama. But I, I'm glad he shared this, because it truly speaks to how deranged this individual is who's just obsessed with trans people. Hey, J.K. Rowling, leave trans people alone. Leave trans people alone. Deal with the fact that trans people are here and they're not going anywhere. Like it or not. So you can try to demonize trans women. You can try to hate against them and be prejudiced against trans people. But all you're doing is making their lives hell. They're not going to go away. They're here to stay. So you can choose to actually be a good person and accept trans people and stop propagating discrimination against them. Or you can keep doing what you're doing and you're going to be judged very harshly by history. Because like all civil rights issues, interracial marriage, gay marriages, women's suffrage, we all know where this issue is headed. It's just a matter of when society is going to change its opinion more collectively. And you're going to be on the wrong side of history if you don't wake up. But at this point, I mean, she she's done so much to damage the trans community, particularly trans women, to demonize them when they're already subject to, you know, uh, violence and, and uh, marginalization. It's just... She's a bad person, and that's all I could say. And she's also a petty piece of shit. Uh, it's certainly uh, not surprising at this point, but of course, I'm going to call you out when you attack trans women because uh, it's not right what you're doing. And quite frankly, it, it's pretty it's pretty disgusting, pretty grotesque what you're doing. You should be ashamed of yourself. I don't know how you live with yourself trying to make the lives of marginalized people harder, but, I mean, she's a millionaire, a multi-millionaire, so she doesn't care. She's insulated, she's privileged, and she doesn't care about the impact that she has on the world. So she continues to, uh, you know, demonize trans people. It's pathetic. Well, that's all that I've got for you today. Thank you so much for sticking with us. If you've made it this far in the program, uh, as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for helping us not just to survive, but thrive as well. You all are truly amazing, and I truly appreciate everything that you do for us. So um, that's all that I've got. Um, if you want more of the Humanist Report, every Thursday at 8 p.m. PST, I will be on Twitch, either talking about politics or playing a video game, but it's always a fun time. Definitely make sure that you check that out. And um, that's, I think, everything. So I will see you all uh, next week. Take care, everyone. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been the Humanist Report. Have a great weekend, everyone.